We're live? Yes. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of MSATP TV. Joining us this morning is Cliff Ryder from Practice Accounting Sales. And Cliff is here to talk to us about buying and selling accounting practices. So if this tax season is getting to be too much with all the tax law changes and the filing deadlines and everything else, and you're just burnt out on it, Cliff's the right guy to give a call so that you can try to maximize your sale price. So Cliff, why don't you talk to us about what all is involved in selling a practice? Well, what's involved is it's, uh, it's, a, it's actually more complicated than what you think it is. It's, uh, you know, from my perspective, you have to get a listing, you have to find buyers, you have to uh, negotiate a price in the, you know, and through a letter of intent. Uh, in a lot of cases, there's due diligence. There's also, uh, you might, we, we might have to arrange financing. And then it all cum culminates in a, uh, uh, what we would call an asset purchase agreement, which in simple terms is a contract. And uh, I've been doing this for 25 years and I can help uh, buyers and sellers go from listing to closing. Uh, the, only, the only thing I really can't do is represent either party as counsel because as my wife, who is a lawyer, will tell me I didn't pass the bar in any state. But I know a lot of the contracts, especially my own, better than most lawyers. And I probably find most of their mistakes too. Uh-huh. Yeah, I passed a lot of bars, but not the right kind. <laughs> yeah, that, not that bar, for sure. Right, exactly. Uh, is there a particular time of the year when it's best to try to sell your practice? Yes, I would say uh, uh, it's, it would be after tax season, obviously. If you have a pure tax practice, uh, I would say May and June, once you get out of tax season, is uh, not the right, not necessarily the best time because, you know, the sellers earned, you know, depending upon the tax practice, 60, 70, 80 percent of the money. Uh, but if you have a practice that's, let's say, right up, or a combination of tax and write-up, you can get going right after tax season. And I take uh, these uh, closings probably all the way into February. I actually had a practice up here in New York that closed uh, a week or so ago. Okay. So in today's environment, the multiplier for selling your practice, approximately what is that number? And well, I it, de it depends on the practice. Uh, it, and it also depends upon where you are. Uh, I would think, uh, that in uh, Maryland and Virginia, in the, uh, let's say, Baltimore County or uh, Northern Virginia or in the D.C. Uh, Montgomery County markets, I would say 1 to 1.15, maybe 1.2. Uh, though pre-pandemic, I did sell something 1.3, but I would, I would say in the 1.1, the 1.2 range, but I would say, I would caution everybody, it's not only the price, it's also uh, the structure of the deal. Uh, as I get older and I'm a baby boomer, I look for more cash in the deal. So I would tell uh, people looking to sell their practice to maybe accept a little lower price to get more cash. So, but I would, I would feel comfortable uh, in that 1.1, 1.2 range. Okay. Um, speaking of the pandemic, have you noticed that that's hurt the sale of practices or, or do you think I would, helping? I, I would say, uh, uh, last year we, we had a fair amount of sales. Uh, it wasn't a career year and it wasn't, uh, it was no near, nowhere as bad as let's say 2008, 2009, great recession, uh, where, uh, you couldn't get money. There's plenty of banks willing to loan right now. The uh, SBA uh, is uh, in their deals is waiving the, the two, two and a half percent guarantee fee. They're, they were giving six months free interest in principal with an SBA loan done by September 30th. They've, mo they've moved that down to three months. Uh -huh. uh, so I, I think uh, it's, it's going to be a good time for sellers and buyers. Uh, for sellers, you don't have to retire. Uh, you can sell a portion of your practice. And, and mind you, the buyers also will have business clients who are going to not make it through this pandemic. And they're going to be looking to buy 
a smaller practice possibly to supplement what they lost. Okay. What I, what I am seeing is that with the trying times and not knowing uh, on the business side who is coming back, I'm seeing more buyers and sellers uh, looking to have what I call a true up clause or an adjustment for people who leave uh, and, and go out of business and, uh, and the revenues of the practice go down through no fault of the buyer or the seller. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, if I was interested in selling my practice, what would I be needing to put together so that you could market my business to get me the best price possible? Well, I, I usually ask if we, and especially if we're looking for a lot of cash and uh, we have to get it financed, you know, make sure you got three years tax, well, you should have three year tax returns, right. uh, but make, make sure uh, your files are in order, your books are up to date. Uh, and the reason why I say that is when a buyer comes in to do some due diligence, the more prepared you are, the more they, the, the more likely there'll be less due diligence. If they can't verify anything, uh, you know, it's going to require more due diligence time. And that can also create certainty. Also of all this, that when you get to closing and if you have a lot of receivables, try to collect them. Uh, you know, it's, it's easier uh, to put them for the seller to put the money in the pocket. And if all the money hasn't been collected, and if these clients are staying over, especially business clients, you don't want to uh, have to start splitting fees from from past invoices. You know, uh, the the goal is to try to clean that up a little bit. Okay. Um, when a person is thinking about selling the practice, is there like a, a rule of thumb how long you need to stay on afterwards to make the transition? That's the one, the most negotiable item uh, that uh, is negotiated. Uh, usually when uh, uh, I'm talking with a seller, before I take a listing, I usually try to get an idea of what the seller is looking for. But if there is going to be that true up that I mentioned or that uh, adjustment or that seller guarantee, uh, the seller having an eye on staying on, it doesn't have to be full time. It, and uh, staying on, it could just be a transition, which is introduction to clients, but uh -huh. it could also be that the seller wants to keep themselves active. They don't want to stay at home watching soap operas during their wife while they're retired. Uh, and some people might need the income. So I think uh, the, uh, I always tell people have an open mind. Okay. But if somebody is picking up and leaving and leaving immediately, and going down, let's say they're up here in New York and they're going down to Ocean City or Hilton Head and without a transition and there is a true up, that, that could uh, get some people to leave that, uh, and I don't always recommend that. I always feel that the stronger the, uh, the transition, the more people will stay. There'll always be people who are leaving and maybe passing away and, uh, and now businesses in the pandemic. But I always uh, recommend some kind of a, a transition, as even if it's somebody's just staying around through tax season and they're gone. But I uh -huh. have people who stay on for years. Okay. Do you recommend that people try to sell their practice before they're ready to retire then? Well, you, you could do that. There is, I, I, I specialize in helping people. I tell people you don't have to retire, you can downsize. So uh -huh. what I mean by that is you can sell a portion of your practice. For example, you can sell your tax, keep your write up. You can reverse them. If you're a bigger firm with multiple offices, uh, let's say you had an office in uh, Ocean City, you had one in Salisbury and then one in uh, Bethesda. You said, uh, I've been, I have people say, well, let's sell the Ocean City office. Well, let's sell the Salisbury office. Uh -huh. And uh, I have lenders that will, uh, we'll do that. Sometimes uh, some lenders won't. It's easier if you have, but if they're all Maryland practices, it's usually a consolidated return. But if you have different uh, tax returns for each practice, that makes it a little easier. Uh-huh. Okay. 
Uh, as far as financing for the sale of practices, mm -hmm. um, I guess the majority of them are through banks and um, the SBA rather than like private investment. I don't see a lot of, uh, uh, I would say uh, pre-pandemic, uh, a lot of the majority and, and the better part of the majority were banks. They could either, either be uh, SBA or uh, just the regular uh, conventional bank loans. Okay. I, I don't see a lot of, uh, you know, people getting money from private equity. Uh, if they're looking to do a lot, buy a lot of practices and they're looking to roll up, you might see some of that. Uh, there are some of the smaller practices are the, I see uh, maybe in wealthier communities, people have the money. You know, uh -huh. if you got a 200, let's say you have a $200,000 practice and with the pandemic, the seller is willing to take 50 or 60%. Uh, this past year, I had a lot of people who just uh, sold some equities and used that and the seller financed the rest. Okay. Now there is an advantage uh, for the seller uh, uh, if, if, it's, uh, if the person's coming in with their own money because the, the seller is gonna be in a second position, a first position with the bar, with the buyer and the bar, who's the borrower. Uh, the, if there's a lender, uh, the, uh, the lender will be in the first position and the seller will be in the second. And I've had some sellers, well, I don't want to be in front of the bank. And I've had to tell them that, you know, if you're not, if you're unwilling to do that, this bank isn't going to loan you the money. Matter of fact, there isn't any bank in the country that will loan you the money in that regard. Right. Okay. Um, when you say that you do the contracts and things like that, um, to take it from A to Z, approximately how long does that, something like that take? Is that a couple of months or is that a year? I usually tell people uh, if, as long as you're not asking, giving me a listing in tax season uh, and it's not in the state, uh, you know, somebody, some practitioner passes away and we have to move quickly. I normally tell people in, in, in good markets in, in, in Maryland and Virginia, three to four months, you know, uh, it's usually what it takes me. Okay. All right. Is there any other advice that you could give our members as far as buying and or selling? Uh, I would tell when you when you're getting ready to make that decision, work backwards, not work forwards. So when you have some idea, let's say you want this to be really your last tax season. Let's take this. So you're going to work this tax season and uh, you should start looking to, you know, May, June, July to. Uh, getting your affairs in order, getting your numbers ready, and then contacting me or, or if you're doing it on your own. But if you're two or three years down the road, take the last year you want to work full time and uh, work backwards, not forwards. Okay. Uh, I would say collect your receivables, uh, depending upon your relationship with the staff. Um, everybody will say most New Yorkers are paranoid, but I... I, I'm, I'm paranoid about disclosure to uh, staff, to uh, if you're in big, big uh, metropolitan areas, Baltimore, uh, the DC market, uh, New York City, you know, people on the same floor in buildings don't know each other. But if in smaller areas, if you're in uh, Leonardtown or, you know, uh, you know, Frederick or, or you know, uh, you know, you, I have to keep a lower profile uh, so the word doesn't get out uh, and just be care. And, and in some cases, people don't want staff to know. Uh -huh. Okay. So final words of advice for our members. You know, I guess the best thing I would tell your members is when people come in and they, 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 they say, I, I use TurboTax, I do my own returns. And should I go to you or should I do it myself? And it would be the same advice here. Uh, do you want, you know, uh, uh, allow a professional to uh, handle the sale for you? Because, you, it, because if, if this is something that you've worked in 25 or 30 years, you're gonna, you're gonna be emotional about it. You won't always cl think clearly. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes if you have your own buyer, and uh, it's somebody you've been talking to for years 
and you can't, uh, 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 you don't want to use a broker, but you need some help. Uh, I will help, you know, I will do some consulting for MSATP members if, if I'm referred by, uh, by, uh, by Columbia and I will work differently as a consultant as I would as a broker. Uh-huh. Okay. So now one last thing, tell our members how to get in touch with you. Well, uh, you can call, uh, you can get me at, uh, reach me at cliff at national accounting sales.com. That's my email address. And the, the number, uh, I'm going to give you the number that I use in my house because I, I work more out of my house than I do out of the office in the pandemic. And that number is 914-722-1029. All right. Well, thank you very much. And Cliff, thanks for joining us today. I look Bill, it's always a pleasure. And I, and I hope people give, reach out to you. Uh, uh, I, I it worked the last time. I, I and if any member has any questions, no matter where they need a form, they need a uh, a, a non compete agreement or a non disclosure agreement. Uh, they don't have to feel afraid to call me and ask me for the form. I'll be more than happy to help the members. All right. Well, thank you very much. You have okay. a great day. Thank you for having me, Bill. Yep. Thanks a lot. Bye bye, bye now.